In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. Acciones nostras quesimus Domini sperando proveni di vanta prosegue contra nostra operazione e sem principia e certa finiate per Christum Dominum nostrum. Amen. Immaculate Spouse of the Holy Spirit, pray for us. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So I wanted to talk about tonight, so that the three days, it's written that we're going to talk about Franciscan joy, but we're not going to talk about Franciscan joy. I want to talk about that on the last night. So tonight... We're going to, can you hear me okay? Is it okay? What I want to talk about tonight would be uh, grace. And then we want to talk about penance. And then we want to talk about Franciscan joy, which is, or perfect joy. Uh, but they call it Franciscan joy because St. Francis talked about this quite often. So perfect joy. What is perfect joy? And we want to reflect on perfect joy on the last night, which is actually quite a beautiful thing to reflect on. But tonight... Uh, there was a request for grace by Mr. Dane. And so, but w- I wanted to talk about it in a different way other than we know a lot about grace when we talk about our catechism. When we look at grace, like what are the different kinds of grace? And that I don't want to talk about. You can look that up in any catechism you want. I want to look at it more from a perspective of the intimate life in God. So grace, the intimate life of God. Now, we'll get into it. Hopefully we'll get into it by the end and it'll make some kind of sense. But So first off, sanctifying grace, or habitual grace, as we call it, it is a supernatural gift of God. Supernatural gift of God. It's something created by God. Give it to us. It's supernatural. By which the soul is made pleasing to God. We'll talk a little bit more about that too. But by which the soul is made pleasing to God by this supernatural gift. It removes all stain of grievous sin. It gives the soul a new and higher life. And it fills it with splendor. And it prepares the soul for the most intimate union with God, which he has destined for it in the blessedness of heaven. Now, when we hear all of that, it doesn't really usually do much. So we need to kind of start picking it apart for our little brains and and help so we can kind of penetrate into it a little bit more. But we come from a culture that, that pushes evolution on us. And if we look at evolution, evolution, that we all come from these, you know, lightning hit a mud puddle, and then life was started somehow, and then eventually that became a salamander, that became a toad, that became a dinosaur, that became a bird, that became a human. And so you have this whole process of evolution and whatever else. But if we, if we learn evolution, we think about these processes of coming to be, we do have a difficult time with that monkey part that Adam's, you know, closest relative's a monkey and that God had to actually just really make a whole nother creature rather than something that came from a monkey. He had to kind of just establish a whole new creature and then infuse a soul into it, whatever. It just sounds like a long shot, right? But if we look at the evolutionary process or scale, or if that's the way we want to think about how God decided to create everything, we get confused on when we ask the question, why do we exist? What is the purpose of our life? And why we exist and the purpose of our life, it has to do with grace. Remember, so mostly this is going to be a reflection to help us try to dig into this a little bit more so we can make it real to ourselves to put into perspective what our life is actually for. And our life is for grace. But what is grace? So that's what we want to look at, right? So if the evolutionary chain would be correct, it would just be that, you know, man was kind of created and after a while God had this plan and in that plan God wanted to infuse a soul. And It's kind of like bit by bit God kind of decided to do something with us. But in the end, like the scientists say, we are nothing. We're insignificant nothing. Right? Is it so much that we're insignificant? Nothing. So grace itself is something that God infused into the soul of Adam and Eve. He created them and then he infused the soul. 
I think we can believe, even with scientific minds, not not being a, a, a radical evangelical fundamentalist. We're, we're not being a fundamentalist when we say, when God said fiat lux, He created everything because He's God. You got to think from one one moment to the next. In God's mind, He has a full image of what He wants. And then the next moment in willing it, he has what he wants. God can do that because he's God. He doesn't have to. And he could have. He could have. He could have decided to use lightning to strike a mud puddle that created life. But why is it that that doesn't represent anything that happens between a husband and a wife? Because the love between a husband and a wife is a communication of love. And that love being communicated is an image of the communication of the love of God, which creates life. As St. Maximilian Colby says, life is creative. Or I'm sorry, love is creative, which brings forth life. We know that from, that's the way it works, right? But in God, if we, if we follow this evolutionary scale, in God it was kind of like an accident. God used an accident from lightning striking a mud puddle. There's no act of love there. There's a process, a scientific process, that he puts in place that then brings forth life that over years and years and years of death and disease and confusion and disorder brings about something beautiful and harmonious. Strange. Because we don't... We don't have things like that. When when somebody gets the flu, uh, it doesn't. It, it might make you stronger that you overcome the flu, but it's not like it, it makes you become I don't know uh, more beautiful or something. Or you get the chicken pox and afterwards uh, your face is more radiant. That's not usually the way it works with chicken pox. So they, they have kind of these 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 strange bad things that happen. Doesn't usually lead to something that's beautiful and harmonious. Rather, the love of God, which was always beautiful and harmonious, brought forth something that represented him, something that was an extension of that love that he had within himself. Now, we have to remember that God is, in and of himself, love. He's love. He's not this, he's not this mastermind giant that lives in the sky that we think of and we are afraid of that's writing down all of our sins. He's love, and love is wanted to create because there's such an abundance of love within the unity of the Holy Trinity. The Father loves the Son from all of eternity. And that love is so powerful that it spirates an action, an action that never comes to an end. And that action of spiration is the person of the, the third, the third person of the Holy Trinity, the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost represents love. And that's why He's the sanctifier. He's the gift. He's the vivifier. The one that dwells in our soul from grace. So grace is an act of love. It's something created by God that He infused into man. When He infused that at their creation, they weren't created, though, like St. Thomas would say, they were created in the state of grace, Adam and Eve. That's true, but St. Thomas doesn't mean that they were they were created like they were they were created in grace as they were created with uh, rationality. He doesn't mean the two being the same. He means they were created and they were infused with with grace. So when the fall happened, all his God did was take back his grace. Because the grace he gave to a creature he made from nothing. He took, well, not nothing, because with Adam, he took it from the slime of the earth. That's what we're made from. He took it from the slime of the earth, and he created Adam. He, he formed Adam. And then he blew into Adam through his mouth and his nostrils. Now, blowing, that es, um, espirare, is to, it's, it's something that comes from within. It's a divine breath that comes from God that vivifies or gives life to this inanimate creature that he just formed. Right? Because it makes him in the image and likeness of God. So he does this for Adam and he gives him this grace. The grace which makes him a new creation. It makes him different than he is a new creation. He's just made out of the slime of the earth. But the reason he does it is because he gives him this gift that makes him like himself. He fills him with something that makes him like God. 
because he gets filled with God. That's what grace is. Grace is something created by God that, that brings a substantial presence of the Holy Spirit into the soul. And the soul then, it, it's the soul that vivifies the body and it's grace that vivifies the soul. So now you have a human being who is in every way full of the presence of God. Hopefully we'll go more into that. But by sin, he lost all of that, right? And then you get this whole process to win it back. But why does... So you see the whole history of salvation from the Scriptures. That's what we have in Scripture. It's the history of salvation, not a textbook on uh, creation or a textbook on um, you know, history. But, but the history of salvation. That whole history of salvation now has to do with grace gets lost. What are we going to do to win grace back? And grace can only be won back by the precious blood of the second person of the Holy Trinity. It couldn't be won by an ox or a goat or anything else. It could only be won by a divine person sacrificing themselves for the love of the creature. And this is what the second person of the Holy Trinity does. And so the grace, uh, the price of grace is the blood of of Christ. So that's why we say that grace itself, a, a human being in the state of grace, a human being in the state of grace is worth more than the entire created universe. Right? You've all heard that. But sometimes it doesn't make sense to us because we live in a time of uh, climate change where we can write books now they'd say that we need to decrease the human population by 100%. <laughs> <Just> like, what? <laughs> and what, what purpose does the earth serve? <laughs> so we have to decrease the human population by 100% to save the earth. We are the problem. Is that right? A human in a state of grace, one human in the state of grace, is worth more than the entire cosmos. The cosmos is everything good created by God. When we say cosmos, it means all creation, everything we can see that's good, because God created all, and he called it good, right? Are you with me so far? From the book of wisdom, it says, I preferred her to scepters and thrones. I accounted wealth as nothing in comparison with her. Neither did I liken to her any priceless gem, because all gold is but a little sand in her sight. And silver will be, be accounted as clay before her. I loved her more than the health and beauty. And I chose to have her rather than light. Because her radiance never ceases. All good things came to me along with her. And in her and in her hands, unaccounted wealth. That's from the book of Wisdom. Stanley, it's Wisdom 7-8. <laughs> You can mark it. Mark it in your Bible. He's the only one who brought a Bible. Wisdom 7, 8 through 11. Beautiful passage. That her, that her is grace. That her is so precious, we would trade even light for her, for that grace. All good things came to me along with her. And in her hands, uncounted wealth. So this, this grace that comes to us, that's, that's, that's so precious and is so valuable, meaning more valuable than, in, than all things created. All things created. More valuable than all things created. We have to get that into our head because we, we don't necessarily believe that. We're, we're made to believe we have to sacrifice ourselves for glaciers. They, they, they've been going around uh, weeping over glaciers that aren't, aren't glaciers anymore. And in fact, the ones that they say aren't glaciers really were never glaciers to begin with. They were caps on volcanoes, and they don't know why they melted. So but it's just that we get this narrative that's so strange. We need to sacrifice ourselves for, for glaciers. But why grace? Why did God create grace? And this is the beautiful thing that we have to remember with grace 
is God created grace because he wanted to take up in the human being, which he created in his image and likeness. But remember, and I've mentioned this several times, I think even here, is if you, if you look in the book of Genesis, when God created man, he said, let us create them in our image and likeness. Remember, in our image and likeness. And then it says, and they create him in his image. Where's the likeness? Now, later you'll see it in different places. That, but Blessed John Duns Scotus goes on to say that the likeness, the likeness, simile, to be similar to, was grace. Grace is what makes us similar to God. When we talk about everyone being children of God, all, all, all of God's creatures, meaning humans, they're all children of God. It's not true. They're not all children of God. They're children of God only in as much as they were created by Him. So in some capacity, He is their Father because He created them. But He's not their Father in the sense of there's not a fatherly relationship with them. They were created. Now, it's kind of like a real... You have a, cr a closer relationship to your dog. You're more fatherly to your dog than what God would be to us. Meaning, you have more, I don't mean fatherly, but more of a relationship. You were both created. You have more in common with your dog than you do with God when you're not in a state of grace. God created a dog and He created us. Right? Now there's a difference because a dog doesn't have the use of reason and we do have the use of reason. So even in the use of reason without grace, we can still kind of know uh, we can still seek God. There's still an idea of there's something out there that created me. There has to be something out there that created me. Because I can see with my eyes that everything is created. Everything comes from something. And so there has to be someone who comes from nothing. We, we, can, we can arrive at that. It's a philosophical question that we can ask ourselves. And we have the ability to arrive at that knowing that, well, the thing that comes from nothing, that's the all-powerful, omnipotent thing that I have to give myself to. That's God, right? So the difference between a human being that God creates, there's such a vastness between that creation and God. What's going to span that difference between the two? And this is where, well, God does two things. One, He does the incarnation. Uh, he would have incarnate. He would have become incarnate. The Word of God would have become incarnate even if Adam hadn't sinned. And the reason being is there would have been union there. Union with the flesh. God would have become one of us. Because of the fall, He's able to demonstrate His abundant love for us. Do you see the difference? Th that's the only way we can say, O Felix Kolpa, that we, that we read in the Exaltet uh, on Easter, on, on the Easter Vigil. O happy fault that Adam basically sinned. We can only say that because by that we see the abundance of God's love, which we would have known before, but we wouldn't have seen manifested, which we see in the crucifix. In the, 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 the wounds of our Lord manifest the, the abyss of love that God has for men. Whereas if Adam hadn't sinned, Christ would have come gloriously, uniting our flesh to His divinity, because inside our flesh is uh, it's, a, it's a composition of all of the cosmos. We have what the angels have, and we have what rocks have, and we have what dogs have, right? So we have an intellectual soul. We have a, well, I guess not a rock, but maybe a plant, a vegetative soul. And we have a sensitive soul, like, like what dogs and cats have, right? So we have material and we have, the, we have the spiritual. We're the only creature out of the entire cosmos, except for aliens, except for aliens, that have all of that stuff, right? So when you're going to become, when you want to unite yourself to what you created, when you want to extend your love so much so that you want your what you love, what you created out of love, when you want that to be part of your family, you, you want it to be part of you in some way, then you want to unite yourself to it. We know that through marriage. But even that, even a marriage is incomplete in that sense 
What, what God's able to do is He's able to assume our flesh, which is the material and the spiritual, in one man, who's the God-man, which makes God our brother. That's an incredible thing. You know, even the aliens can't say that, right? But with this grace, we still haven't arrived at why the grace. Essentially, it's this. Everything he created, as we call those things that he created, uh, we, we, we would say everyone's a, a child of God. Everyone's a child of God. And that's true in as much as they were created, like we said a minute ago. So everyone's a child of God in that, in that sense. But grace itself, it's that character of the divine. And it's not just a character. It's the substance of the divine. Now, I have to correct myself in that a grace is not a substance. It's an, it's an accident. It's something created by God that he infuses into our soul. But when God infuses grace into the soul, what comes with the grace? What abides with you with grace? The Holy Spirit. And what is it of the Holy Spirit that abides in you with that grace? Just his character, just his gifts, just the virtues. No. Those things are there because the substance of the divine now vivifies your soul through that grace. Does that make sense? And that's where that's where the gifts come from. That's where the virtues come from. Everything that we receive, those gifts that we receive from the Holy Spirit, they are given to us because His substance is in us and He can't be in us without vivifying us with those things. That's what, that's what makes that divine, intimate union with God so real in us. And that's why the talk is grace, the mystical life of the soul. If you're in a state of grace... You are in a mystical state that you're not realizing, that you're not living, that you haven't entered into yet by way of the functions of eternity. And that, that I hope we will talk about a little bit. I have some things written down that keep me on track if we get to that. I got a question. When you say a child of God, I thought you want to become a child of God through baptism. Yeah. Not necessarily, you know, creation. You're you're absolutely right, but a lot of times we'll talk about um, all of God's children. Uh, you'll talk about some pagan or something. He's a child of God too, isn't he? And we mean that. We can affirm that and say yes, because he is a child of God in as much as he was created by God, but not in the sense that we have, where we actually become. We have, so to speak, the divine blood running through our veins, which is grace. So this presence, when we talk about the presence between um, the way God is present to everyone, and God is present to everyone. He's present to everything he's ever created. And it's called the omnipresence, right? Because God's everywhere. And the way you think about it is this. Because God is, there is no place where he is not. God isn't a being that has some kind of sensible, containable element to him. He is. And when he creates, that means existence is his. He is existence. When he, is, when he says, I am who am, it's because existence is what he is. When someone says God doesn't exist, that is the, that is the, the greatest blasphemy that any wretched human could ever utter. Because you have somebody who's received their existence as essentially nothing is saying that the one who is everything and gives existence doesn't exist. Did I confuse you? Is it too much? You said exist too many times. People start to shake their heads. No, you know what I'm saying. So existence itself isn't somewhere. He is. And you can't have something that exists unless it's sustained by that existence. The one who communicates existence, unless he maintains it in existence, 
you don't exist. So whenever you think you've been abandoned by God, you know it's an absolute lie from the devil because if he abandoned you, you would be annihilated. That means if he stopped thinking about you for a second, you would no longer exist. You just wouldn't exist anymore. Because you exist, God's providence holds you in existence. And if he wants to hold you in existence, he's going to take care of you too. And that can be trusted. So the difference between that omnipresence of God being everywhere because he exists, he is existence, uh, you can't find a place where he's not. That means he's present to absolutely everything he's ever created. Present to all of us. Present to the pagans. And that's where he speaks to us in our conscience because he's, he's present to us. He wants us to do what's right. He wants us to go to heaven because we were created for that. We weren't created so that we could become a lawyer. We weren't created so that we could be a doctor. We weren't created so that we could be a garbage man. We were created, and nobody thinks that. Whoever's going to be a garbage man, nobody thinks they were created to be a garbage man. That's my vocation. No one thinks that, even though they're a good garbage man. But when we talk about jobs where you make a lot of money, then we say we were, we were made for this, right? We, we, we tend to think along lines of whether or not something is of value according to our financial income. We aren't created for those things. We are created for the glory and honor of God. Punto and basta. That's the way they say it in Italian. So just to say, uh, full stop. <laughs> so... But the difference between that presence of anybody and our presence is completely 100% different. When he comes to us in grace, as the soul fills the entire body, you can't find part of your body that doesn't have your soul vivifying it. Your finger doesn't move. It does not just because of your brain. It's because if, you cut my, if I cut my finger off, it's, of course it's not connected to my brain, so it's not really a good example, but it doesn't have, it just dies. It no longer is vivified by the soul, right? And if we take grace away from the soul, we're spiritually dead, and our intellect can become darkened, and we start to make worse and worse decisions, right? So that presence of God is through grace. God infuses that grace into our souls, and in the middle of that grace is the substance. Remember, the grace isn't a substance. It's an accident created by God which he communicates his presence to our souls by infusing that grace into our souls. And when that's there, it's the Holy Ghost who resides in our soul in a substantial way, making us truly temples of the Holy Spirit. Not just, it's not a symbolic thing. It's real. Now, the point of this talk is, if that's real, then how do I cooperate with that? And what does it mean to have the Holy Ghost truly live in me? And what does he want from me? That's a big deal. Those are big questions. And the point is this with God. He does not come to those who don't want him. Those who seek him, and he says it, doesn't he? Those who seek will find. Those who ask, it will be answered. If you knock, um, well, I'm probably getting it all messed up. It'll be open to you. But when we seek him with grace, when we seek him with grace, we find him. And what does he want us to find? He wants us to find eternity in our soul. What does that look like? Oh, we'll get to it. I got some stuff written down somewhere on here. So this presence that he takes up in our soul, it only comes to rational creatures. And it only comes to those who seek him. He only establishes that familiarity, a real familiarity. Now, think about it. God wants familiarity with you. He seeks familiarity with you. Everything he did in that salvation history was to reestablish a relationship so that you could want that familiarity with God. Now, that familiarity with God establishes you as a friend. The love of friendship is of equality. This is something we can't understand. This is a mystery. God elevates us to become equals of God. In friendship, 
Because our Lord said, and this is what makes sense in John 15, 14 or 14, 14. I got it written on here somewhere. So John, no, I don't know. John 15, 15. It's where, where our Lord in that last discourse uh, where he's talking to them. I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. Friends are equal. How are we equal with God? It's because God establishes his divinity in us. This is what it means to be members of his body. He's the head and we're members of his body. By being members of the body of Christ, it's not like I always say the profane, but the, like the, the membership to like any time fitness, right? That's, it's not that kind of membership. It's a membership of we are members of his body. In heaven, those who are in heaven are members of his same flesh. In that sense, when when God sees those who are members of his body, they see Christ. Our Lord sees Christ. How can you not get into heaven if you die and God sees Christ standing at the gate? No, not only do you get into heaven, you enter into the abyss of his love, into the infinite happiness of God, into the fullness of his love. You possess the knowledge of God. These are the things that happen when he finds Christ in you. I would ask if it makes sense. No, it doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't make any sense at all. That's we have to spend our life seeking that familiarity and we will find that familiarity through prayer. You'll only find it in prayer. This elevation as friends of God means a certain equality. Therefore, he's not just present to us as he is to a dog or to other creatures. But he has. uh, uh, When we say that we're children, it's not it has to be understood properly. Okay, I've already covered this. They are sons who have grace and they have grace who since they have sought it, they've sought it from God. God makes those rational creatures his sons and takes up his abode in them who seek him. But in this same way, God does not. We're, we're very egalitarian when it comes to things. We all want to be equal. We don't like hierarchy. We don't like somebody being in charge over top of them. When it comes to this grace that we seek, we all receive that grace as a seed, as a seed at our baptism. Those baptized souls who seek the profundity to understand what that grace is, they seek that familiarity of that presence of God in them. Who, who, who seek that longing, loving relationship and want to enter into it in a real way, the more they seek, the more they find. And so there isn't uh, an equal way in which we all participate in that grace. The saints have a greater abundance and each in their own measure according to the effort with which they sought that familiarity. And that familiarity with God is that ever entering in deeper and deeper into that mystical relationship with God, that mystical life of God. But that mystical life of God, when we talk this way, we kind of shut down a little bit because we read the works of St. Therese and these others, and we hear mystical and we think, oh, that's a process that we're just not going to arrive at. If you're in a state of grace, you're there. You're there, but you won't do what you need to do to enter into it further. The mystical life is grace. It starts with grace. The longing for the familiarity takes you further and further into it. Why would God want to be bring you into his intimate surroundings if you're not even looking for it? That's what we're supposed to be doing on earth, not playing with our phones. You know, you're just flipping. I watch people with their thumbs. They're just flipping the thing. There's no mystical union through flipping Facebook or watching television. I'm not bashing electronics, but if you're using them all the time, you are not going to arrive. You're not seeking a deeper, more familiar relationship with the Almighty who is present in you. You're wasting time. You say you want to get to heaven, but you're not willing to live it now. That's what it is. It's heaven in us 
right now. It's the ability to live what heaven's all about right now. But we get tired. But I want to relax. It's been a tough day. Yeah, all that's all that's true. But what if you learn how to sit still and not rely on your phone, not rely on the television, not rely on talking to somebody on the phone to waste more time? What if you sit there? Well, what happened to Elijah? Our Lord came. Our Lord came to him and started talking to him. When he needed food, he sent a bird and gave him food. He made him. When 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 Elijah decided to. With these armies, his army, 50, 50 soldiers came. And they, they told him, Elijah, you, you got you got to come with us. King wants to talk to you. Elijah just did one of these. If I be a man of God, send down fire and consume these 50. And fire came down and consumed the 50. And then the next 50 came. You haven't heard this? It's a scandal. God killed people. Oh, man. <laughs> and then another 50 came. And they said, Elijah, you must come down from there and you got to talk to the king. If I be a man of God, send down fire and consume these 50. Boom, fire came down and consumed the 50. Then the next captain came with his 50, and he came and said, Please, man of God, (laughs) please, man of God, I'm only doing my job. Just please come with me and talk to him. So he went with him, right? (laughs) But when when you have an intimate relationship with God in this way, he listens to you. It's a very, you, you, you wonder why you pray and nothing happens. Things do happen, but you don't know what's going on because you don't pray properly. You don't seek him properly. You don't live for him properly. You're wasting your time most of the time and living for this world. And then when you need something from the other world, you can't understand anything. Or am I making it all up? It doesn't apply to you. Probably doesn't apply here. For this reason... The reason, see, okay, so I'm going to read you a quote that comes from a, a, a beautiful theologian, but it's it's about that difference in the the amount of grace that we have, right? Why do we have differences in grace? The reason is that this grace cannot work in us, and it cannot work because we do not seek it devoutly. Devoutly means being disposed towards seeking it properly. Because we do not seek it devoutly, eagerly, and with a humble heart. We cry out to God, why aren't you listening to my prayers? And we throw a temper tantrum and turn our back and say, well, fine. Well, we can't do that with God. You just can't do that with God. Because we do not love God wholeheartedly and with all our affection. Because the eye of our intellect is filled with dust and dirt of transitory things. Television phone, all the pictures we're absorbing all day long. Because we do not wish to die to our sensuality and to be converted to God with all of our heart. That is why the light of divine grace does not operate in us. That's why you're not living the divine. That's why you're not in a mystical union with God. The grace doesn't work in you because you're not seeking Him with all your heart. When you, you, this is the way we examine our conscience. You have to look at how do you think about and seek the things of this world, and how do you think about and seek the things of the next? Which one absorbs most of your time? Well, you're going to say, but I live in the world. Yeah, of course. God knew you were going to live in the world. He knew you were going to live in the world. And he still expects you to be in union with him because he created you to go to heaven, and he put you here only to get there. So what's the problem with being in the world? The problem is how you're using your time in the world. And that's what has to be examined, right? We are to have our conversation with God in heaven. So our cooperation with these graces and this indwelling, that infusion of grace into our soul, creates already that indwelling of the Holy Trinity, right? But it's most perfectly represented in the third person of the Holy Trinity because he represents love. Grace is a gift of love that God gives us. And so that person of the Holy Trinity that that resides in us is the vivifier of our soul. It's attributed to him because love is attributed to him. Love is attributed to the third person of the Holy Trinity 
because he is the love between the Father and the Son, because he's the perfect knowledge of God. The second person of the Holy Trinity is the perfect knowledge of God the Father. And when God the Father looks into God the Son, which is perfect knowledge of himself, knowledge spurs or it, 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 it spirates forth in that deep, profound love of perfection, seeing that perfection, it spirates forth that action we talked about of the Holy Spirit, which is the third person, the Holy Trinity. He represents the love between the Father and the Son. So when things deal with the love, that's attributed to the third person, the Holy Trinity. So that's why the, whole, the third person, the Holy Trinity, resides up. He resides in our soul and vivifies us from there. He's the one that, that, that our dear Redeemer, when He's back with the Father, sends. He sends the Holy Spirit because He sends the, the fruits and the grace of the redemption to give us the ability uh, to do what we have to do, right? That is to love, serve, and honor God. So when this indwelling starts... It's a, it's a mere seed, a seed that comes at our baptism. And from that time, we exercise the functions, the functions of eternal life. What are the functions of eternal life? The functions of eternal life are to know God as God knows himself. The functions of eternal life are to love God as God loves himself. The function of eternal life is to possess God as God possesses himself. And the final function of eternal life is to be immersed in the abyss of God's eternal happiness. Do you really want to lose heaven for the happiness of this world over the abyss of eternal happiness? Our, our eternal functions that are already present in us today are to know God as God knows himself. To know something, think about it. Think about how you feel if you're depressed or you're kind of run down. But then you read and you learn something new. You ever do that? You, you, you take up something, you learn how to do something new. It, it just kind of perks you up and you want to tell people about it. You, you've added something. You've done something good. You've brought something good on board. It, it makes you feel almost young doing something like you, know, you never had that before. Now you have that, right? Well, what if you could possess the knowledge of God? as God possesses himself in knowledge. He wants to offer that to us as a function of eternal life. Love, it makes us kooky here in this life. What if you could be immersed in the love of God? If we even think about that enough, we'll start to weep. What if you were actually to be immersed in that love, in the love with which God loves himself? Not just to be loved by God, to love God as God loves himself and to be, be immersed in that love. That's a function of eternal life that we have now through that seed that's hidden inside of us, that's grace. If you could possess God, that we feel always feel so abandoned by God, if you could possess God as he possesses himself, that means you possess all things. And this is why they say God doesn't offer us the ability to come into his kingdom he offers us a share in his dominion. We can't even understand what that means. How can I have a share in the dominion of God? That's the, that's the heredity that he offers us. We're real sons. And he has a, a real heredity that he leaves for us. When I die and go to heaven, God willing, God wills it, I just have to cooperate. I take on a share of his dominion. These are the thrones. That our Lord said, you will sit on thrones of judgment because you share in the dominion of heaven. And to lose yourself, lose yourself in the abyss of the happiness of eternity, of eternal happiness. These are the functions of eternal life. And these are the functions that come from grace, which starts eternal life already in our souls. And that's what grace is. And that's what we seek. Uh, that's why we seek to grow that grace so that we can ever grow in union with God, preparing ourselves for that eternal union that lasts forever. We don't wait for heaven to live heaven. We've been given grace to live heaven and pass to heaven. 
it makes sense. Any questions? You say race was created, but is that restricted to human race, not animals submitting and adapted in my human life? So is it really restricted for humankind? No, the angels are in grace. How did they, I mean, they got it at creation? Yeah. So, well, they weren't, they weren't, they didn't get to see the face of God right away. So we know that they were, they were tested. Uh, they were already pure intellectual spirits who had to be tested. Um, and after they were tested, they were confirmed in, in sanctifying grace. So the angels in hell don't have sanctifying grace because they failed and everything. But um, so they, they, it was kind of like Adam. I mean, it's a gift that's bestowed on them, right? And it's a gift that the ones who, who fell lost. But the gift to eternal life had to be won through cooperating with God's, um, with God's will. So yeah, they don't have eternal life. Now, a spiritual thing, God can annihilate things. And though some today say that um, if we're evil, we just get annihilated, that's nonsense. God doesn't annihilate. God could annihilate, meaning He could just make you not exist anymore. But it wouldn't be just if we have to suffer through all this stuff to get a reward uh, and there's no punishment. Since God's perfectly just, that means if you don't cooperate, you get eternal punishment. Uh, but they have eternal death. They don't have eternal life. They have eternal death. They suffer eternal death. Uh, those who die suffer eternal death. They will exist forever in death. But it's not like we think of death, like you close your eyes and you go to sleep forever. We don't close our eyes and go to sleep forever. We pass from one reality to the next. And the next reality is more real than this reality because that one never ends and the days don't change and you don't get any older. You just suffer a whole lot or you're immersed in happiness completely. Uh, does that make sense? So the, the demons and damned souls will exist forever in eternal death. And they'll live that eternal death for eternity. Yeah, the greatest pain is the absence of God. That's the greatest pain of hell. I mean, there's, there's real, there's real physical pain. Um, there's, there's the pain of the conscience and other things. But the greatest pain is the pain of loss, the loss of God. Because here, no matter how depressed and how bad it gets, you always have God's love, whether you think it or not. No matter how depressed and and how run down you feel, and even if you're having thoughts of suicide you still have God's love. It's all around us. You're just not noticing because you're selfish. But when you die uh, in a state of sin, you don't have God's love anymore. You have, you have the absolute opposite, which is a torment that would be unbearable for all of eternity. It's something we can't imagine. You know how it is. When anyone who's, We probably all felt it. The older you are, you felt it. The discouragement weighs on us. The difficulty starts to weigh on us. The darkness starts to kind of get all around. You start to feel really discouraged. Maybe you're even getting depressed. All this kind of stuff mounts, and you want to hurt yourself. This is the ten. That got, the devil will get you to want to hurt yourself because everything gets dark and it gets hard and it gets heavy and you start to hate and you start to hate yourself because you want to destroy yourself. That's what hell is. You spend all of eternity trying to destroy yourself, but you can't. It's just a constant desiring to be annihilated out of hatred for your own self, and you can't do it. It just gets worse and worse for all of eternity. But even here on earth, like I said, there's still love. Because you can't, you can't find a place on earth where there's no love. There might not be love in your heart, but God's still there giving you grace to convert you, whether you're cooperating with it or not. In hell, nothing left. You're just completely abandoned. Because if God left some kind of presence there, it would be more torturous. So really, it's God's mercy that abandoned you in hell. So it's a horrible thing to think of. His mercy abandoned you into hell. Because St. Augustine says it's worse torture to be loved by someone you hate. And so God's merciful, and so he won't do that. He'll just, he'll just leave you be in your... Because if, if he were to show his love to them, it would torment them all the more. He doesn't do that. 
Any other questions? No? We can just say a quick prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Agimus tibi gratis omnipotens Deus, proniversis beneficis tuis, qui vivis et regnas in secula seculorum. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. It was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Immaculate spouse of the Holy Spirit, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, God bless you all for coming out in this hurricane. <laughs>